we had Nick come on Tuesday, and he went over the quiz, and I asked him to just do stuff around the material. He's got his own way of solving these levels. He did it a year ago, and he shared with you some of his GDB trickery and so forth. Um, I plan to just pick up where I left off, so this may be somewhat redundant today. Maybe that's okay. Um, before I dive into the material, I want to quickly address the issues with the website. So somebody, several of you have noticed that the stuff is screwed up again. So the private area doesn't work. And I figured out, found out what's going wrong. They're moving the web server from one machine to another. And so what they had been doing is, like, I'll make changes to our web page, and those changes aren't reflected. And it turns out they were slowly copying the changes from where I was making the, the alterations to another machine where they're slowly migrating our web server to. But I don't have access to the actual web server site. I have access only to the old site that they slowly, like, periodically copy updates to. So that sucks. So now they've completely migrated to the new one and turned off the old machine, and I don't have access to the new machine at all. I mean, they said that I do, but uh, it's called, so the old machine was called Home, and now it's called Home 2. And it doesn't want me to log in. So I can't make changes to our website, which is pretty cool. So I'll get that sorted out, and then we'll get things working again, and uh, I don't know. If, if you want slides, I think we're all up to date on slides, but if we start going to a new slide deck and you want slides, I can just post the slides to Slack or something instead. The slides change from last year at all? Yeah, I keep changing them, but often in minor ways. Okay. Like I'll pull a slide or I'll add a new one or something. But all of last year's are still up. All of last year's, yeah. So now we can go to the private area. Look at the slides. Oh, you can? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying like the last I tried it, which was like yesterday or the day before, private area was broken again, and I can't fix it because I can't change anything on the new machine. Uh -huh. And so you can't get to any slides or any. Yeah. And slides are the most critical thing in the private area, I think. <coughs> and as Bryce said, things so are mostly the same. Possible? Possible? It's just like a, it's yeah, like I can do that. Slides, that'd be good. Yeah. I mean, let's go check. I don't know. 90% chance it's yeah, still broke. Afternoon, yeah. So, and I can't even get on this machine to find out. So what happens when there's an internal server error is Apache will uh, give a detailed reason for what happened in an access log, but it's on that machine. So I have to log into the machine to see the access log, and I can't get to the machine. And on purpose, it doesn't tell you, why doesn't it tell you what's actually happening? Like, is there a permissions problem on one of the HD access files or, you know, the, the detailed reason for why this internal server error occurs. Why doesn't it tell you here? It just says in this configuration. That's right. Yeah, so it would give too much information to an external attacker about how the system's working, and whether he's making progress by changing it this way and this way. Oh, I see what's going on. It's this... Maybe I can get around this problem. So very limited information on purpose for security reasons. All right. Anyway, I'll get that straight now, and I'll pass post slides in the meanwhile. Um, so what happened on Tuesday? He went through some attack scenarios. Was it useful? Yeah. All right. Well, I intend to just pick up where we left off a week ago. Um, how are people doing? I guess I can check. So when I say, like last time I said get to level five, that means break level four, right? Because breaking level four gets you to level five. Now you need to get to level 10. And uh, that means break level nine. So some of you are close. Some, one person's there already, Alex. And the rest of us, many of you are, are close to that. Um, it, this is much harder, as you've probably noticed, than the first five levels were, right? Everyone's laughing. It's like, why? Is it, why are you laughing? Level eight, <laughs> level eight is brutal. Level yeah. eight requires yeah. you to yeah, actually <laughs> open a server, right, and use your networking skills, and you have to send the shellcode over TCPIP. Plus, it's a hard exploit, 
right? Isn't it like corrupting some counter on the way to the overflow to get past? Yep. Yep. Somehow. <laughs> Still trying to figure that out. Okay. This is why I'm telling you, you know, get an early start. Um, yeah. These are almost all, for sure, level eight <laughs> <laughs> servers. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I, some of those. <laughs> I think one of them is uh, one that I went in GDB and forgot yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that happens a lot. If it crashes in GDB, it'll just leave the port open. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell me, um, what happens if you just like leave a level 8 server? Some of you aren't, aren't haven't started level 8 yet. Uh, Looks like half the class ish is on it or above it. What happens if you so so for those of you uh, who are not yet there? Level eight requires that you run the victim. The victim is a server, so it's a TCP server, and it opens a port, and you tell it what port to open. That way, you don't all run into each other. And then you have to attack it via a client that's going to connect to that port, just like we do with Netcat. Let's say that your attack doesn't work and the server recovers and still keeps that port open. Why is that kind of a sketchy thing in, given the nature of this class and the people that you're sitting next to right now? Because somebody can spawn in the shell with your permissions. Okay, so uh, let's say I'm running level eight and I'm sitting here and I'm trying to get it and I can't figure it out. I've got a server running. Who owns that server, that process? I do, right? It's running with GID of level nine, effective GID of level nine, that's the point. But the user, not only the effective user ID, but the actual real user ID is JR Black, okay? So if you've already solved level eight, you already have shellcode ready to go, and you see me open this port, you're like, well here, have some shellcode from your client. Now the client's running is you, but it's shipping shellcode over the network to my server that spawns a shell as me. Or does whatever you tell the shell, whatever the shellcode is, as me. So what could you do? <coughs> Quiz one, right? Huh? Get permanent access. Yeah, get permanent access to my account by creating a shell and, and putting on the set UID bit. Or whatever binary you want, but just copying. You can run whatever code you want. So you can run code to copy bin shell to your own your own directory, change the you know with me as the owner, and then set change the set UID bit under your shell code because I'm the one who has to do it. But then after that, anytime you run that shell, you become me, right? And this is remember I told you this guy Davis Yoshida did this. This was the level he did it on. In fact, it was worse. He didn't find orphaned processes that were still sitting on. You know, two days later, a week later, some student had left a server running for level eight. He was actually, every 10 milliseconds, checking for anybody who got to level eight. As soon as they ran a server, he was like, I got your show. <laughs> Which is a hard problem for me to solve, because how do I stop people from doing that? Anyway, please don't exploit other people's level eight servers and take over their, their account. It's not, it's not neighborly. Okay, any questions? Isn't this due um, next Tuesday? <laughs> yeah. Um, some of these people may be, like I know Curry is teaming with somebody else. So sometimes only one account will go up, so we don't have to, I don't have to think like, oh, he hasn't started yet. Something like that. He's teaming up with somebody else in the class. So it may be fine. All right, any issues? Says the homework itself and how challenging number eight is. Well. No, we're good. Nine is hard too. I don't think nine is as hard as eight. Eight is, eight is like. Easier to read than eight at least. <laughs> yeah. That was cool. That for you. Was it nine is like? Oh, no, no, okay. Nine is the long for It is. Okay. Yeah, I think they like an hour. He probably took at least ten hours. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, eight's not the hardest one in. <laughs> well, <laughs> so. Uh,
<laughs> it's clever, right? Because you have to like, as you overflow, you actually hit the counter that's counting on the overflow. So you have to overwrite the counter with the right number so that it'll keep going. To that's one of the nice hints that I have before I say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm open 24-7 on Discord, so just like if you're stuck and you're spending 10 hours and you want me to... Oh, yeah. yeah, I started bugging Nick at one point. Oh, you yeah, did? Yeah. Okay, yeah, Nick is... Yeah, he was really helpful. Good, good, good. Wait, which Discord server are we talking about here? I'm Seems sorry, Slack. did I say Discord? <laughs> Slack. Okay. My kids talk on Discord and I'm my class is on Slack and I, I mix them up sometimes. I say Slack to my kids sometimes, too. They look the same. More or less. Yeah, they're almost <laughs> oh, the same yeah. thing. Just a doubt about... Uh, so, when we exec a level, Suppose I'm executing level eight or whatever. Shouldn't the effective GUID change? Suppose you, effective user ID? G. GID? Should change of the running program, right? Exec actually copies the yes. programs. Yes, but only when you actually run it. If you're in GDB, it won't. Okay. So when you when you use ptrace, which is the system call that the debugger uses to attach to a process, it drops privileges. Because otherwise, if you're in the debugger, you can actually change the process. You can modify it. The right process. That is getting to me. The GDB is showing my effective group user ID. I'm like, what's happening? It, yeah, it will drop privileges. But not if you run it live. If you, if you don't attach a debugger, it'll run with elevated group ID. And also, he went through um, set follow work mode child. Like, if you want to follow, when you're, when you're uh, debugging through level 8, it's going to spawn a child. And you can choose in the debugger to follow the parent or the child, and you want to follow the child because the child's the interesting part that has the exploit. Is there a way to do that in GDB without having to type it in every single time? Yeah, dot GDB init RC. Like there's okay. a there's a startup config file for GDB. It's called GDB init or GDB init RC. Okay. So, is this familiar from 2400 or whatever? So you can always like the one for 2400 is you set set break explode bomb, because there's this bomb lab, and you don't want to explode your bomb. So you just put a breakpoint in the bomb, explode routine every time in the init file. Also for exec, set follow exec. That's what he's asking. No, this is a, yeah. Oh, set That's follow exec is different from set follow for. Yeah. yeah. And you can also catch exec, so you can set a breakpoint. Mm -hmm. um, It's d dot gdb in it. Okay. It will look in that and it will execute all commands, gdb commands, at startup time every time. Thank you for that. It saves time. Yeah. Yeah, because often you'll forget and you have to start over again. All right, anything else? Okay. So. No idea where we were, but we'll figure it out. I think we were right around here. So I was going to exploit this victim, and some of you have already done this on the homework, but I'll show you. I don't know. Maybe there's some tricks I use that will be helpful for those who are still behind. This is a victim that has a very simple overflow in it. It has a buffer of size 256, and it stir copies from argv1. <coughs> To this fixed type buffer, and since it's not stir in copy, stir copy, that's obviously a problem because there's no balance checking, right? All right, and we have shell code. We developed it in class. We tested it in class, um, and we left off here where I was showing you that if you turn off ASLR, address space layout randomization is what that stands for. Address spaces were addresses for all your text and heap and stack. Uh, if that layout is randomized, it means that, among other things, the stack is moving around. For those of you who've done now one of these exploits, you understand why it would be horrendous if the stack kept moving every time you ran the program anew. But since it's consistent, right now on Razor, the stack ends at this address. So all of these stack addresses are up in high memory toward the, toward the end of max32 unsigned integer. How would you even do one of these buffer overflows if it's randomized every time? You have to keep guessing. Really? And there's something, yeah, there are some tricks that help, and there's a whole paper about, <coughs> it's not completely randomized, not every address is equiprobable. They do it on like 64K 
byte boundary. So it's not moving as you know like completely random as it could. And, and if you're in a 64-bit machine, it's game over. Because then it has a lot more different places that, for the stack to be, because you've got so many more address possibilities given the size of the address pointers. But on 32-bit machine, it's quite practical. If you're in an environment where you get multiple tries, like you do on the homework, you get infinite tries. Sometimes you only get one try because it's like as soon as you crash the victim, a human has to restart it, and then that human gets suspicious. So you can't just sit there and do it over and over and over. All right. So let's go exploit this victim. Um, I've got some hints on the slide, but let's just do it live. Can people read this? So here's my victim, same program, and I'm going to compile it minus M32, so it's a 32-bit binary stack boundary, it's going to be aligned on a 4-byte boundary. We're going to allow exec stack so that I can execute stuff that's on the stack, because I'm going to inject shellcode onto the stack of this victim. Turn off canaries, the rest is standard. So what do we do? Um, okay, so use GDB. And when you run the program, you give the command line parameters here at the time that you run the program. So I don't know why, but every hacking book that's ever been written uses capital A's as an example to find on stack. And we'll put a break at main. And here's what's going on. So there's our preamble we're very used to by now. Save the frame pointer, change the frame pointer to the stack pointer. And what's this 100? Zero zero? It's allocating 256 bytes on the stack. <coughs> That's for our file name, our local variable, our buffer that we're going to overflow. And then um, this is checking arc C. Remember, positive offsets from the frame pointer, pointer are going to be arc C. I mean, going to be um, parameters. So eight from down from the frame pointer is arc C. Twelve down would be arc B. Sixteen down would be M B. And this is because I was checking to make sure that there is a parameter before calling st string copy. Here's what we're really interested in. We're interested in the string copy call, and what we want to do is so we've got. I wish I had a whiteboard. That was erasable. Um, I'm going to try to use it anyway. dead pen too, so this is maybe just a fail. So we've got file name. It's 256 bytes, right? What's right after that? This is your local buffer, local uh, variable buffer. Memory's increasing down the picture. So higher and higher. This is our stack. What's right after that on stack? Save the ABP. The saved frame pointer, because there's no more locals. It was just that single local. So I've got the saved frame pointer. And after that? Turn address, that's where we're most interested in, right? And after that, RC, and whatever. All the way to the bottom of the stack, which is at FFF. All right. 
So what we're interested in doing is, at the moment the string copy occurs, we're going to copy from argv. Where's argv? I mean, argv is here, and it points to probably something around here. It's going to be what? How many pointers? Two pointers, because I'm not going to supply. So argv is going to point somewhere down on the stack that you can see. And it's going to have two slots followed by four zeros, right? Four zero bytes, that's the null pointer. And this first one will be a pointer to a string, which will also be on the stack. It'll be called, I guess I called it victim. And it'll be a null terminated string, so I'll put quotes around it. And then there'll be another null terminated string for whatever I actually typed in or sent on the command line. And so what's going to happen is string copy is going to receive two pointers from the two. It's actually destination comma source when you call string copy. And it's going to say, OK. Until I see a zero, copy something from this dot, dot, dot area, copy a byte from here to here, and then increment both pointers. And just keep doing this until I see a zero byte down here. <coughs> um, I'm going to put shell code here, right? Why do I need to copy my shell code into the buffer? Why can't I just jump to the shell code down here? It's already on in the stack, and the stack is executable. Why do I need to copy it up to the buffer? It's not a shell code you're going for. It's trying to buffer over to the return address. So that's right. If you want the jump. So actually, I could. I could not even put any shell code into this buffer. Right. I could jump down to here instead. Mm -hmm. What I'm really interested, as Hamza just said, is mostly I'm interested in overwriting this. I'm going to override it with this. Address, but I could override with that address. I do need to put shellcode in RV1 because I got to put shellcode somewhere in the address space of this victim. But I really have the option when I override the return address of putting this address where the shellcode is down here, or this address of the of the buffer itself where the shellcode is up here. Usually we go for this address because a lot of times we're exploiting a buffer overflow. We're not actually on the machine like we are on Razor. You you're logged in. So you have a huge amount of control. You can control the environment variables that are down here. If you're um, over a network connection like you are on level 8, for us, level 8, you still can control the environment because you start the server. But it could be a remote server you're exploiting where you have no control except for you have one TCP channel over which you can inject your shellcode. And then you're not going to be able to like affect this other stuff. So, to do the normal practice, what we're going to do is we're going to insert, inject shellcode. Our shellcode is only like 43, 45 bytes, something much smaller than this. So we'll inject our shellcode. So string copy will inject shellcode. Then we're going to just pad it out, fill up the buffer. And then we're going to overwrite this as well which won't turn out to matter because we're never going to return to the call caller where this would matter because we're going to corrupt this value and jump to our shell code and so this will never matter. And then we're going to override the return address with the address of our shell code. That's the plan. Okay. Okay. So what would an exploit look like? Um, how about like this? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a program in Python, which I've already done. That program is going to copy this exact same bytes of shellcode that we already developed last time we were together. Remember last time, what we did <coughs> was we got 40-some bytes of code in machine language. We got rid of all the zero bytes, 
because we know that string copy is not going to proceed if there's any zero byte anywhere in this mess. So there are no zeros. This part right here actually doesn't matter. This was important before, but now it doesn't matter. Um, in fact, this X as well it doesn't matter. Because we're going to be adding a bunch of padding anyway. So what does this Python program do? It says, print out the shell code, so whatever these bytes are, and then append, that's uh, when you add two strings in Python, it's concatenation. So concatenate the letter A, and multiplication times a string just repeats that string that many times. So if I say ABC times 10, I get ABC, 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 ABC 10 times. And why 256 minus the length of the shell code? That's enough to fill up the buffer, right? So that's print out capital A's, print out the shell code, then print out enough capital A's to fill this buffer. So that gets me to here. This is going to work every single time. There's nothing like, oh, I have to guess, do some guesswork here. It's going to work every single time because the buffer is always 256 bytes large. Then four more A's, what's that going to do? Clobber this thing. And then a specific address. Here I've got, <laughs> excuse me, FF, FF, <laughs> D4, 5, 8. Why are the bytes backwards? Little endian. Intel is always little endian. Uh, ARM is big. No, ARM has different modes. Can be big endian. Um, Motorola 68K. You know the Macintosh used to use Motorola processors. As of, I don't know, as of a five or ten years ago, they stopped and went over to Intel. That's a big endian machine. So you don't see big endian too much. Network byte order is big endian. Send integers over the network. But yeah, little Indian, so the least significant byte comes first. So you have to read this by reversing the bytes. Okay. Um, what is this address that I'm writing here? It's what I'm it's what I'm writing into this slot. Right? So it's the place that after the string copy comes back, there was nothing else in my code after string copy. The victim said string copy and then main ends. When main ends, it's going to do a leave. It's going to restore the frame pointer to this bogus place that I've clobbered. Fortunately, it'll never look at it. It just restores it. The frame pointer goes like to 41414141. That's AAAA that I've overwritten. Bogus save frame pointer value. Um, and then it's going to do a return, which will pop this value into the EIP and cause the program to then start executing it, whatever I said. So what address do I want to put here? I want to put whatever this address is right here. And it'll start to execute bytes. If you were below um, the top of the buffer, would it just start an infinite loop? Just... If I like, started in here? Yeah. Yeah, probably I'm going to jump right into the middle of my uh, machine language, and it's not going to make sense. It's going to be in the middle of an instruction. It's going to get an illegal instruction. It's going to seg fault, crash. Yeah. There's almost zero chance it's going to actually spawn a shell. But if you had like no ops instead of A's? We're going to get there. Would it just go in a circle? We'll get there in a second. OK. Are, so, you, are you getting that address? By looking in, you're just having to figure out. Getting this address goes. is the hard part. Yeah. Everything else is reliable, the same every time. I know how big the buffer is. My shell code is relocatable. It doesn't have any hard-coded addresses within it. But this is a hard-coded address, and there's no trick to get around on the fact. You need to know exactly what this address is so that you can put the proper place here for it to jump to and start executing. And how I'm going to get this address sucks. Like, it's going to be very temperamental. And for example, if I change the size of argv1, like I add some more stuff to it, this then grows. This pushes everything down. This value goes into a lower number. Everything you do. if I change the name of victim to victim one, then this gets bigger, and then that pushes that back down by a byte. So all the stuff, every little thing you do, all your environment variables, you set a new environment variable, it's going to get 
stuck here, which is going to push this buffer. So the buffer keeps moving. It's not moving because of ASLR. <coughs> right? If we were moving for ASLR, we'd never get this value right. This buffer would be all over the place. But it's going to move a little bit, and it's going to maddeningly, often maddeningly, move when you're in GDB. Because GDB is going to cause some perturbation here in high memory, which is going to, you're going to go, okay, GDB told me it's right here. Cool. And I put that number in, then you run it live, and now it's no longer there. It doesn't work again. This is especially troublesome on certain levels. All right. So let's go and just do the most obvious and intuitive thing. Let's just go into GDB and get the right address here, which won't be the right. But anyway, but you can see that if I have this number right, then if I were to execute this, and the way I'll execute it is, I'll just do this. Right? So what's going to happen? Remind me. What does dollar sign parent blah dollar sign do? It executes as a shell command, whatever's between the parents, and takes the output and replaces dollar sign parent to close parent, replaces that with the output of this command before the victim is even run. Okay, so that's done in advance. Same as backticks. That was the Santa Claus trick. You could inject this into Santa Claus and he would execute this stuff. It'll execute this, take the output, put it here. Well, this program, as we just saw, prints out shell code plus buffer, plus the guess at where that shell code's gonna land on the stack, and terminates, that's what the Python does. So victim wakes up and just sees 264 bytes of crap, right? And there's only 256 bytes of, of buffer, with 264 bytes of stuff, it's gonna overwrite eight more bytes, which is exactly what we want. This is just an easy way to get binary supplied on RV1. And string copy doesn't care that this is not printable stuff. It'll just copy it. As long as there's no zero, it'll just keep copying bytes. You have a hard time typing this in by hand, right? I mean, bash has a printf too, and you could type backslash x and put binary out there as well. So there are various ways to do this. But you can't just hit a key, and it's going to you know, give you the proper you know, eb for the first byte of machine language to do our call instructions. I mean jump, or jump instruction. Okay, so let's run the victim and find out where that buffer is. That's the only thing that's hard for this simple example, is finding out what number to put here, in other words, what address this is at. So let's go find out what address that's at. The GDB victim, I'll break it main, and I'll run it with four A's, and what I'm interested in now is where that uh, local buffer is, that file name buffer. So I can take a look, let's see. If I say, um, let's take a look at 64 bytes of the EBP. What's that? That's the save frame pointer, so that's this which is all zeros every time we look. There's no um, frame above us, we're at main. What's this? That's the return address that I would like to corrupt. Okay, so the buffer is gonna be uh, 256 bytes before this. I guess we could look at it, it's just gonna be garbage, right? It's just a stack variable that's uninitialized. This is what's currently in it. And then, if I want to see the four A's get copied, I guess I can put a break right here. How do I set a break there? Star. Star. Star and the address, right? So let's continue. And I should now see four A's, or 4141. 401. Four, four times. So it copied that, and then it copied a null byte here at the end of the string copy. But what I really care about is this. This is the number. This is the address of this buffer. So if I were to copy something from RV1, it's going to go to this buffer. I want 264 bytes. So it's going to be shellcode, shellcode, shellcode up about here. Then it's going to be into four ones all the way down. And then I want to eventually overwrite 
the return address, which is right there. Okay? So let's make note of this. It's FFFFD528. So I'm just going to go in here. FFFFD528. That's the address of the buffer. Are you following what I'm doing? This is like the crux of the biscuit right now. And voila, shell. <laughs> okay. So uh, it didn't work. And it didn't work because that's not the right address of the buffer. The reason is, is because, well, tell me. Was the thing with GDB? Sorry? Something with GDB. GDB may have perturbed it. RV is changed. What? RV. The length of RV1 has changed, right? So I put AAAA just to get where the buffer is, and then I gave it 264 bytes, which is 260 bytes more than my four A's, which caused everything to move. All right, so let's go into GDB with an actual 264 byte long RV1, and get the buffer to move to the proper place. Ha ha, that'll work. So GDB victim, break it main, and this time I'm going to run it, and you can do the same stuff in here. So now where's my buffer? Not D528 anymore, right? Let's go take a look. Um, D528 is where the EBP is. I want to go 256 bytes back from that, right? So if I say EBP, it's D528, but I want to go back. Do you, do you follow why I'm seeing D528 where the EBP is? It used to be if you went back 256 bytes from EBP, it was D528. Now the actual EBP is at D528 because that got bigger by 256 bytes. So everything's moving back by 256 bytes. So what I want to do is go... I could have done that in my head, right? Minus one zero zero hex. So I'm going to go to D428. Do you follow what I'm doing? Tell me if you don't follow. I was slightly confused because I thought you just changed those couple bytes in the Python code. I did. Okay. Didn't you run that same Python code just beforehand? Yeah, but... Why is it suddenly in the bottom of our stack? Um, so I just reran the victim. This time, RV1 is not four bytes long. It's 264 bytes long. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Which caused, the, which is 250, 260 bytes bigger than it used yeah. to be, which is causing this to move. So now, this used to be at D5, D6 to 8, now it's at D5 to 8. Yeah. And this is now at D4 to 8. Okay. So this moved back by 256 bytes. Yeah. So now I need to go change my SC1 exploit to D4 to 8, and then it'll work. <laughs> okay, aha. This is, this is what doing the homework is like. Now I got it. <laughs> Surely it couldn't move again. D4 to it. Mm. Well, it was illegal instruction before, now it's segfault, so that's progress. Maybe. All right, so it's gonna, it should work in the debugger. In fact, if I were in the debugger, it would work. Like, I can go right now and single step through, and it would spawn a shell. And it seems like life is not fair so that when I then do it without the debugger, it doesn't give me a show. All right, here's a trick. And this is especially used for a level 12. So I'm going to turn on core dumps. And I said really quickly last time what a core dump is, but. Um, a lot of Unixes, if configured correctly, will, when they crash, illegal instruction, segfault, whatever, will take a snapshot of memory of the running <laughs> process and write it to a file for you to examine. So let's run it with core dumps enabled. Notice the difference in error message, right? Segfault, segfault, core dumped. Now, there's this file here. 
This is a memory snapshot of the process when it crashed. So if I say GDB victim core, so you put it on the command line on the GDB command, you add the, whatever the name of the core file is as the second argument. Remember your command line arguments go in the run command within GDB. It tells me where exactly the seg fault occurred. It occurred at this, what is D42? <coughs> That's the address I jumped to. So it looks like I did correctly overwrite the return address. That's not a surprise, because I know exactly how far to go to hit the return address. And I got to D428 is what I wrote. The problem was it jumped there, and there was crap there. There was not my shell code, right? So that's just not at all surprising. My buffer wasn't where I thought my buffer would be. All right, so let's find out where my buffer is. Now, I'm going to look right now at where the buffer is. Am I looking at the buffer as I'm running this program in GDB? No, I'm looking at where it was when that core file in the live victim crashed. I'm looking forensically now. I'm not looking at a running process. I'm looking at a forensic crime scene of what happened when this thing blew up. Okay, And that should be consistent when I run it again in the live program. All right, so the EBP was at 41414. Does that surprise you? No, that's exactly what I clobbered the EBP with. Right. And why is it 41414141? Huh? Four is. But why is it loaded into the EBP and not just sitting on the stack? <coughs> it's because it exited, so it got to leave. The, the epilogue, right? As it was exiting, restored the EBP to this crap value and then did this return, and then jumped to this address, and there was no shell code, and then it crashed. Um, bless you. All right, so let's look at, I don't know, let's look at this memory address. This is what I attempted to execute. You can check with I. If you do 64i, you'll be able to see it with instruction in the sure. middle of the Sure, sure. I can do i. So Hamza is saying, you know, you can, you can effectively disassemble by saying examine slash i. I'm just looking at bytes to see where my shell code is. Um, I know what my shell code looks like in, in binary, too. So this is all buffer, right? This is all padding. And my shell code starts right here, eb. Is the start of it? The thing with slash i is you have to get it on the proper boundary so that you're not disassembling in the middle of an instruction. You have to get it on the instruction boundary. But I can also like just go, well, my shell code is eb165b31. Uh, eb165b31 right here. So. It's unfortunate stock starts on so <laughs> D four five eight. And let's let's take Hamza's uh, advice and do it slash I so it disassembles. It says jump down to here, call back, pop, do the entity zero, here's our slash. So that looks good. So the actual correct value is D four five eight. Yes? And that was in the live victim. It was generated. Not in a simulation, not in a GDB hosted environment. D458. Now is it gonna work? Yes, it will. But that wasn't the easiest thing ever. Okay, so I spawned a shell. But I had to get this number exactly right, D458. And core dumps saved the day. Because without that, I would have just been, you can also just guess a bunch of times, and I don't know, it's frustrating. And in some real world environments, you may not get infinite tries before someone notices, like, someone keeps crashing my web server every five seconds, I better 
stop restarting it. See what's going on. So we said 5A. <coughs> what was it? D to 5A. 5A. So, so that means like roughly GDB put how many bytes additional? Oh yeah, what was it before? Two eight. So three zero. So that's forty eight bytes. I don't know why. But it was generating forty eight more bytes somewhere high on the stack as part of the GDB environment. <coughs> and that's not going to be consistent. So you can't just go always oh, subtract forty eight and then it'll work. But I guess like if you didn't have access to core dumps in your life, you're just gonna like try this. You'd be shooting in like that sort of range. Yes. Being like kind of one hundred to twenty. And bytes. I've definitely done this. I've done a bunch of war games around these kind of buffer overflow exploits, including ones that are way harder than anything on Razor. And often I ended up just running a loop and trying like <laughs> everything until it works. I'm not proud of that <laughs> story at all. Okay. All right, so that sucked. We have to hit it exactly on the nose, and all of you already know where I'm going with this. Hitting, yeah, hitting it on the nose is just too hard, especially when there's a trick. Okay, so these, I'm just showing you how I found the addresses and stuff. And this is the thing I just ran. These are not the right values that did eventually work. Um, so, Getting this to work is hard. So let's introduce this new instruction called exchange the accumulator with the accumulator. Does the flags register get affected on exchange commands? The flags register, you know what that is? In an x86? Okay. So registers on the x86 are EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX. EBP, ESP, our friends, EIP, instruction pointer, ESI, EDI, some extra registers that are fun or whatever. On the on the 64 bit, you get a whole bunch more registers. You get another eight from R8 to R15. We don't have them. We're doing 32 bit right now. Um, there's another register called EFLAX. You can examine it. It's uh, It's this. It, it has this value. So it's right here. And it's a flags register. So what's a flag, typically? It's a binary value. It's a 0 or a 1. And we've got a bunch of them. So what do we do as computer scientists when we have a bunch of binary values that we want to package up and move around and send across the network? We package them into a bit mask, right? So we then, then you know all the tricks about you mask out the value with an and, you set it with a with an or, with a bitwise or. You had to do all those tricks in 2400 to show you can shift so many over to get the bit to be at the least significant. You can and it with a one, pull it off. All these tricks, right? But you're smushing all these maybe unrelated flags together into one place where each position, each bit position can be zero or one and each one has a yes-no value. So there's a flags register in the x86 that says, you know, this is saying that the, sat, the sign flag is set. This is saying the interrupt flag, and I don't know what RF is. There's an overflow flag, there's a zero flag, but these are um, telling you the current, the last operation you did caused an overflow. It'll set the overflow flag. Then you can say jump on overflow to this other place in the code. This is how, like, if you code in C and you say if A greater than zero, it'll just take the value A, which is a local variable, let's say, put in the accumulator, set the flags, and then just say jump on zero to here, or jump on greater than. Otherwise, don't. So typically,